So it's Friday morning before the job. This week we've been getting the framing up and today we're going to be probably putting up some of the first roof rafters here. Usually Ron has a group meeting. Uh, we go over what we're gonna do for the day and I thought that I could give you guys a look inside what that's like. Uh, a day in the life of an Earthship build. Last week's update, I interviewed Ron and we talked a little bit about some of the foundational details and told you what we were gonna be doing this week. And this week, all the framing has gone up. So now you can start to see what this building is gonna look like when it's gonna be completed with glass and metal flashing. So things are getting exciting. So if you're into this kind of thing, which I assume you are because you're watching this video, be sure to subscribe to The Offered Guru to be updated when all the videos are coming out. Right now, I'm releasing a video every week showing you progress on this build, which is far from completed. All the interior finishing and things like that, so stay tuned. All right, guys, so here we are at the end of another work week. Uh, we're aggressively moving through phase three of 11. Phase three in the middle of October is extremely important. So I had one of my carpenters build the window boxes in his workshop. So they all came out perfect. We pounded all our stem wall tires, three courses, leveled them really well, put a vapor barrier in, and then we put our plates on top of that, ready to receive that perfectly dialed window boxes. I did do an oversized front door because there's gonna be a lot of gardening happening inside of this greenhouse. So I actually have it where you can bring a wheelbarrow in without smashing all the framing. <clears throat> We have our plates on the top that's ready to receive the greenhouse roof. Uh, I don't know if we're going to get to it today. We are ready uh, with materials here with the 2x12s. We're going to put 27 of them up there. Before all that, we want to talk about the skylights. <clears throat> so when we're doing the framing for this front greenhouse, we want to prep for the boxes that are going to actually go over the 2x12s. It's a detail that a lot of people are like questioning, but for strength and for approval for the framing inspection, we let them run all the way through. We put the box on top. So when you look up, you do see framing inside of the skylight box, but that's where you can hang your cam cleat and run your ropes. So I like it for stability, especially with high winds out here. It locks down that, that big box and that heavy lid, you know, a little tighter to that greenhouse roof. Inside the exterior greenhouse is the interior greenhouse. Same details, very meticulous carpentry for your window boxes, your door buck, your pony walls. Your pony walls are going to typically receive plumbing and electrical. So I didn't really explain that to my crew. They just kind of made it happen. Now it's gonna make more sense on the back end for them. It's not just a matter of getting the framing up to receive plates and then the lamy beam. The laminated beam is basically liquid nails and screws and ring shanks and you basically sandwich a bunch of two bys together to establish the height of where the roof line is actually gonna be kind of finished. So those projections off the lamy beam come up to the front greenhouse and to the back where the bond beam connects to it. All right. Now, another important thing when it comes to an earthship is the tires turn out up front. So what we did was, and this was also filmed in an earlier session, where we porcupine all the framing and then we come up with cans and cement, mortar, to actually grip it to the tire wall. It's the bond beam of framing to the tires in this way. So we've shown you earlier how you tie in a bond beam to the tires and now the plating's up there. So one thing that the crew needs to know before we get too excited and finish up the Lamy beam and jump on TJIs, because that's what we want to do. We want to try to weatherproof this thing in. So when the weather changes, we have weather on Sunday, we have more weather coming in on Tuesday. We want to try to get under roof as quickly as we can so we don't shut the job down and we're able to work every day till the finish line. The next thing that has to happen is we have a plate that's locked down to the bond beam concrete and steel pour. On top of that is another plate. That plate is the sandwich plate. That sandwich is going to come off 
and we're going to slip in an EPDM. It's a rubber liner. It's ethylene propylene diene monomer. It's 45 mil. It's the thickness of a credit card, one and a half. So it's really, really strong, really durable. We're also using it as a radon barrier in the house. So there's already two rooms already have radon barriers underneath the building. We'll get into more of that a little bit later. So we want to sandwich the EPDM in. That way the thermal battery, the tires, essentially the entire body of the building is waterproof now. So even if we got dumped with snow or rain, it has a way to shed away far enough that we don't concern ourselves with a capillary effect. The capillary effect would only happen if the dirt got wet and it just sucks it back in towards the back of the tires and eventually inside of the tires themselves and then ultimately into the tire wall on the inside. No bueno, we really want to waterproof this building. It is the desert, it is a dry environment. Most people are like, why do you guys go so far above and beyond to waterproof the building? Well, we spend a lot of time handcrafting the finish work on all the wood details, all the adobe mud plastering on the walls. Sometimes we do a mud floor. We can't risk having any kind of water get into this building from anywhere. Certainly not the roof, but definitely the walls are always a concern when you wrap the building with three sides of earth. With climate change happening all over the world, it's happening to us too, slower here, but it is happening. I'm constantly thinking about the next several generations. What kind of maintenance are they gonna be looking at? What materials are gonna be available then? What's gonna be obsolete? Today, these are the materials that we know work. And we know that by taking some of these extra measures, most likely this house is gonna surpass pretty much just anything else on earth. I know it is. It isn't likely, it is definitely going to. I know I only have 16 years at it. Michael Reynolds has about 52 years on it. You know, geologically speaking, that's not a very long period of time. But when it comes to construction and man-made materials, we know that this process is gonna be successful because we've tested it in different places around the planet. New Orleans, Haiti, Puerto Rico, Sierra Leone, all these other places, we've gotten pounded with these heavy storms and built earth ships to deal with it. The wind ships, all these bomber buildings that Mike has designed. Well, I could have the mentality every day come to work and just like, ah, it's good enough for Taos. I could have that attitude all day long. It's good enough. Well, that isn't good enough for me. It's not good enough for the family who is going to be moving into this house in the next several generations, as I've mentioned. So that's where we are today. That kind of incorporated our meeting simultaneously with what the work schedule is for today. Goodbye. Awesome, I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Thanks Ron for that. Uh, I'm gonna be trying something new here. This video is not over. I'm actually just gonna be breaking up the video into two parts. So in the beginning, I'm going to be showing you everything that we did this week. And then for the second half of the video, I'm going to let Ron explain what we're doing next week, which I don't have footage for. So it's mostly just gonna be Ron talking to the camera. Uh, for those of you who are diehard fans of this material, uh, owner builders or interested in doing it someday, some of the best nuggets of information are gonna be in these second half of the video where Ron's gonna be explaining some intricate and detailed aspects of construction. So if you like this, then please let me know in the comments section below so I can continue to do it for other videos in the future. And then for those of you who just want the exciting update of what happened this week, then the first half of the video is for you. So without further ado, Ron is going to explain the rest. So after that sandwich is put back together, screwed down together, now we're ready to lay out our TJIs. TJIs, same thing, 27 of them, 16 inches on center. I've redesigned this simple survival frame roof. Typically we'll do, I don't know, maybe we could do Vegas, maybe you'll do roughs on, nominal, a different type of truss. Uh, I chose to go with the TJI. The reason why is I like the idea of the insulation detail that's gonna be happening most likely on Monday. What we're gonna do is we're gonna start with a TJI right in the middle of the house. We're 16 inches on center. We're gonna put one on either side. As we get that first TJI mounted, then what we're gonna do is we're gonna cut poly ISO insulation in strips. Now, I was all bummed out because ABC Roofing in Albuquerque told us that they didn't have any four inch poly ISO. Today, every day, I expect a supply chain problem. 
and I have been throughout the entire process of this job. When I get a phone call and says, hey, we have one left, we get in the truck and we drive out there immediately. The year before last, ah, I'll wait for the next shipment. Well, we don't do that anymore. Right now, there are a lot of interruptions in getting materials out here, including the polyiso. So it turns out that they had three inch. Well, we were gonna do three layers of four, which gives me a 12 inch insulation stack with two inches of ventilation that can cross over the top of the TJI. But they tell me that they only had three. So now we have to go with four layers. So that's more time cutting, more time installing, slower sandwich process, slower pinning process, and br bracing and blocking and all the things we need to do to get that insulation R value where I want it, which is gonna be at 100. Nobody else is doing that. I think Mike has got one airship that's being currently built with an R100 value. Nobody's ever seen that, not in this country. So it turns out that actually it was a blessing in disguise. I was all frustrated about it. I'm like, oh man, for all those reasons. But now I thought about it a little bit further. A four inch polyiso panel, you can't run your saw through it. It leaves meat at the bottom, which means the extra time of turning it over, cutting it down, keeping it clean, keeping it parallel. We don't have that problem anymore on a three inch. Essentially, we're just using our circ saw or, you know, because eight and a quarter will cut straight through that. So we're going to set up a jig or we can set it up on the saw and just feed them through. So the boys will be able to just run the insulation right down through the saws. They'll all be perfectly parallel. They'll all be ready to go in. It's actually faster than four. Sometimes it works out. Most of the time not, but in this case, it's a blessing in disguise. So once we get that done, now we can start talking about getting the decking on. We got 5.8 CDX here. We're gonna put all that down with the H clips so the wood has a place to kind of expand, contract. One of the issues we have with these buildings is that when you're living in them, you hear this popping sound. And the reason for that popping sound is that metal's conductive. So it's expanding and contracting. So it's stretching up on top. Well, as it's stretching like this, it's actually rubbing on everything underneath. So that sound actually transmits through the insulation, through the framing into the home. So what we wanna do this time is we wanna have that little air cavity at the top and that insulation is gonna be just a little bit lower. So that way when that metal is cooling down in the evening, like right now it's the high, even if the highs are 30, at night it's gonna to get to below zero. Well, during the day, even though it's only 30 degree air temperature, that sun is heating that metal up way over that. So the fluctuation of temperature from the day to the night can be 70 degrees, 80 degrees. So of course that metal is starting to contract. And so you hear that sound. So I've been thinking about the way we're gonna put this roof together to try to allow everything to sort of wiggle, do its thing, <clears throat> not strain the building, but provide a nice peaceful, quiet environment inside of the building. So then after that, we're not gonna mess with 30 pound roofing paper. 30 pound roofing paper is not 30 pounds. The oil tycoons, you know, sell it as 30 pound, but really they keep pulling some of that petroleum out. So as I roll out that roofing paper, if we don't cover it that same day, it just starts tearing and disintegrating, photodegrading, all that stuff, and it's worthless. I'm not gonna take the risk of having an inferior product waterproof my rainwater harvest airship. Seems like common sense to me, but apparently it's still being used, so we're gonna spend the extra money and put ice and water guard down. So what that means is we're gonna run the back edge with this strip and you just peel the paper and it glues down. When the sun hits it, it just heats up that tar and glues it down to the deck. And then you run a shingle piece right over top of that with a little overlap, run it all the way up. If we get hit with a massive snowstorm, doesn't make any difference. The building is gonna be completely waterproof on the berm with the EPDM, all the vapor barriers that are coming up with the thermal wrap and now the ice and water guard. Once the metal goes on, I mean, I'm usually really nervous and paranoid about it at that point, because usually you have to have specialists come in and understand how to bend and make sure everything is fitted properly, good overlaps, the hems, the drip edges, all those terms are understood how to fabricate them here at the site. We don't have a company that makes the metal for us and we can just order it and pop it on the building. We make them 
because everything is organic. Everything's different shapes and sizes. So we, we custom fit the cladding of the roof. But again, because I'm doing these extra things, now the other thing next week, on Wednesday, we're gonna put in these six front windows. They're called PDRs. They're standard dimension glass. We're gonna put an acrylic latex bead on the inside. We're gonna have it on setting blocks. We're gonna have little blocks made so when the glass truck shows up, all six windows are already sitting here ready to go. The glass comes off the truck, doesn't touch the ground, goes straight into the window box. The blocks are made to screw it and fasten it into the frame, into the strut. That way it's held in place long enough to set up, but it also gives me time to get the mullion ca caps added to it, to metal it out. Now we're gonna go one step further. Once the glass is installed, most likely at the end of that day or early the next morning, we're gonna come in with an additional bead around the glass because it's one inch thick. So the, the, the acrylic latex is just gonna press the glass against the frame and stick, but it leaves a gap. So we're gonna fill that gap flush. And then if it does rain or snow, water's not getting in beside the glass and in the frame. Again, doubling up, waterproofing, extra steps when you're dealing with harvesting water and the power of Mother Nature. It's relentless.